What's going on fam? Welcome back to the channel. Thanks so much for joining me today for episode 8 of the Instagram Q&As. As you guys know, Monday mornings, Pacific Standard Time, I post a Q&A on my Instagram, which I answer in short form. And then of course on YouTube, like this video, I answer them long form so you guys get a better idea of the long answers, the more detailed answers, and we get really into the nitty gritty of the questions that you guys have and you guys have posed. So without further ado, let's hop into the video. Just a quick reminder, it's at noah.cavanaugh on Instagram, so that's how you can find, post all your questions, or you can DM me and I'll answer them directly there. All right, question number one. Will you do another chain of Zoom sessions after the first eight? Yes and no, I will definitely be offering another Zoom session uh, and moving forward, I will definitely be doing more stuff with the Zoom. I think it's been an amazing opportunity for me to connect with you guys and then also be able to help out in any way that I possibly can. I think it's been an awesome opportunity and I've met some really cool people through it. So you can always go in and book a coaching session and that's not technical coaching, but any sort of mental coaching or session planning or anything like that that you'd like to do, you can go book that on my website, www.noacavanaugh.com. It's in the store and you just book, uh, you pay for an hour long session. We usually go way over that, um, but either way, you guys get good value and a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. So that's what you can do. As far as another chain of Zoom sessions, my guess is definitely Definitely not in the super near future, simply because I am jumping into a season hopefully very soon. I am flying up to Ottawa tomorrow as of the day that this video is being filmed. This will be out on Saturday, so I'll still be in Ottawa while this is being filmed. So again, with all of the shifts and changes in my life going on, especially with my fiance involved as well, it just doesn't make a lot of sense for me to be getting up every single Sunday, especially if I have a Saturday game and I gotta sleep in and stuff. So that's the plan for now, but you can always book a Zoom session if you guys want um, and we can go from there. So definitely hit me up on the website. Question number two, is 183 centimeters enough for a defensive position? Okay, so I'll be right back. I'm gonna look up how many centimeters 183 is in like foot and inches, and then I'll be back. Okay, we're back. So 183 centimeters is six feet almost exactly. It's like 6.0039 feet, so it's six foot tall. Uh, so is 183 centimeters enough for a defensive position? Six foot tall? Absolutely. I think you can be six foot tall and play center back. You can be six foot tall and play outside back. I don't think it really matters. You have guys like uh, Jordi Alba who are super small and play left back. And you've also got guys like Marcus Alonso who are super tall, like six two or six three, who also play left back. And then I would say for the most part, center backs tend to be right around that six foot mark or a little bit taller, uh, especially at the top level. So I'd say if you wanna play center back at 183 centimeters at six feet tall, brilliant. If you wanna play outside back, also brilliant. If you wanna play defensive mid at six feet tall, also brilliant. I think. Again, my philosophy is always it doesn't matter what the height of the player is, it's how they use their body. So again, focus on the things in training and in lifting and in your programming that are going to benefit you and your body the most. So for instance, for a player like me, I'm 5'10", I'm fairly average as far as height goes for footballers, it's kind of right in the middle. I'm not going to be focused a ton on, yeah, okay, my de defensive and offensive headers, but I'm not going to be a crazy aerial threat like somebody who's 6'3 is going to be, and I'm also not going to be super low center of gravity like a 5'5 five five guy. So I've got to be somewhere in the middle. I've got to focus on my own strength, focus on explosiveness, focus on the things that are going to benefit me in my position, and then you go from there. So again, I always think height really doesn't matter at any level if you're using your height and your body and your weight and your strength correctly. Question number three, what is your goal three years from now <laughs> to play in the USL championship and or MLS? So three years from now, that's the level I wanna be at. If that happens in another country, if I'm playing first division in Denmark or Sweden, then fantastic. But I wanna be in the first division somewhere like MLS or somewhere in another country or USL Championship because it's in the US and it's playing around my friends and family. Question number four, what is your favorite boot from the current Nike lineup? So I haven't tried out the Tiempo Legend 9 and it makes me really sad because I ordered them on soccer.com 
and Soccer.com did a bunch of pre-order stuff, and I ordered them as soon as they came out, and this is not a hate. You guys know I love Soccer.com. I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but I do really love their services and stuff. I ordered it on a pre-order. I didn't hear back for almost a month and a half, like six weeks or seven weeks, so I called Soccer.com, sat on the phone, because they've been so busy because of the, the virus and everything going around, so... And, and delays in manufacturing and work uh, in other countries. And so what basically what happened was I waited six weeks and called them and I said, hey, what's going on? Like, what's with the order? It still says it's being processed or something. And the guy on the phone was like, and this was two weeks ago, so this is, we're still in September. This was two or three weeks ago. And he goes, well, these boots aren't gonna be even shipping out until December. And I was like, what? So anyway, cancel the order. I'm gonna try to get those Tiempo Legend 9 boots in because I think those would probably be my favorite. Right now though, out of the boots that I've tried, which is every other boot in the lineup, including the DF variations of both the Vapor and the GT, I'd say the GT is my favorite and it fits the best on my foot, even if it's a quarter inch long. Question number five, what would you do when you can't train? Hmm. Okay, so I'm a little confused as to the question. I'll answer it a couple different ways and hopefully one of those is exactly what you mean. So what do I do when I can't train? If I can't train because I'm injured, so I physically cannot or not allowed to via doctor's orders, I cannot go and do my football stuff, right? So that's, again, via injury, it's because I physically can't do it. I focus on the mental side of the game, I focus on my nutrition, and I focus on learning tactical awareness of different positions in different formations, and then I watch a ton of football. So those are the kind of the things that I focus on. It's really important to do all the extra stuff when you can't physically do the movements. Do everything that with what you can. Do everything you can with what you have. That's always the, the go-to saying in my opinion. So definitely consider that. So if I can't play because I don't have a team, and I can't play, uh, and I don't have a, a high level team to play with, I'm in the middle of no, I'm living in the middle of nowhere, I would train like a maniac on my own, and honestly, if you are very, very serious about playing at a professional level or even a collegiate level someday, I would recommend moving, and I don't say that lightly, I understand that it's a lot of financial stuff and it's a lot of whatever, but I have had friends who lived in Walla Walla. I, a very, very dear friend of mine lived in Walla Walla and she drove twice a week, four hours into training in Seattle because there wasn't a high enough level team for her in Walla Walla. So that's the type of commitment you gotta be willing to do if you wanna make it to the top level. And she's now a starter and a captain on a really good collegiate soccer team and wants to play professionally. So that's something to think about. So again, do, do what you can with what you have, right? Same message applies for when I quote unquote can't train, but this is the, I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I am, you know, not the, the large teams or the big competitive teams aren't near me. That's the first piece of advice I would give is either train a bunch on your own. I should say, and it's a, it's an, and not an, or train a bunch on your own, do all the things you possibly can contact coaches via Instagram, LinkedIn, text message, whatever you can get your network started so that you can get workouts from those people. You can watch YouTube videos that are free, right? They're there. Of course you watch it a couple ads here and there, but like that's still free, right? It's just, you skip them or whatever. So you go in, you watch those YouTube videos, you get those training drills and you start to really get disciplined with everything you're doing. So you're eating well, you're doing mindset stuff, you're watching a ton of football and you're doing all that stuff. Then I would do my very best to get to a team because that is what's gonna take you to the next level. Playing games is the most important thing bar none that you can do for your fitness. So those are that's two different angles I would say. I hope that answered your question or a combination of both in answer to your question, uh, again, DM me if that was your question and we can talk more about it over a Zoom call or we can talk more about it just on IG or something like that. So great question though. Question number six, how to improve in-game awareness, practicing cognitively difficult drills and playing in a match and playing with the highest level possible. So that's three answers, right? So the first thing is to train drills that are really cognitively difficult. So whether it's different colored cones, it's uh, different numbers, it's a 
I've seen that I, it's a little high tech for me, but you see these iPads that people put on a tripod like this camera is on right now and they put the iPad there and it switches cut like flashes different colors and numbers and stuff and you always have to be checking your shoulder to make sure that you're getting those colors and numbers and you call them out as you're doing a specific drill so you're always checking your shoulder so that type of stuff is great for game awareness I would say the second piece of that is get in game-like situations like really high-paced small-sided or larger games really get in with those but the most important thing when you're talking about game awareness is play with players as best you can that are better than you. Because the faster that you play and get used to that speed of play, the quicker you're going to have to be aware, right? So you're going to have to be aware of where everyone is or most of the guys are on the pitch at all at once. You've got to know, okay, as soon as I receive the ball, two or three passes before it gets to you, what are my options going to be? As an outside back, I'm thinking... I've got a goalkeeper, potentially, if I really need an emergency. I've got a center back. If both of the forwards are pressing closer to me, I can chip it over them to the other center back and go the other way. Or I can hit my CDM, my center attacking mid who's checking, my forward who's checking. I usually stay away from my winger simply because it's a little bit too linear and you stay on the line as opposed to being more three-dimensional. But that's just a tactical thing. That's my own brain going put him in a we don't put him in a weird position unless he's by himself and then of course isolate him but if he's wide and i'm wide that doesn't make any sense because they can counter inside and that just doesn't do anything so you get the idea though that's for game awareness so play with players that are better than you play in a big type game situation or go into a futsal match and really get used to swiveling your shoulder you look at I know there are videos out there of guys who have counted the number of times players like Iniesta, Xavi, Pirlo, Gerard, Lampard, all those very, very incredible center mids, and other players too, but especially those center mid guys, check their shoulder, and it's It's like 40 times a minute, which is crazy. I mean, it's every like half a, a second, second and a half to two seconds at most. They're always checking their shoulder, always checking where everything is. So that's what I would do for game awareness. And then again, just do drills. If you can't be in a game type situation, you're on off season or whatever, do drills that are really, uh, if you know the term proprioceptively challenging, proprioceptively challenging environments for your body are balance drills, things that challenge the way that your, your gravity works kind of thing, right? So you lose a lot of proprioception when you get injured because it's a lot of the stabilizing muscles. Do that same idea, but for your brain. So do really intense, different types of drills, different colors, different numbers. Maybe it's a coach calling out or like holding a different colored cone, etc. That's something to think about. Question number seven. Do scouts care if a player doesn't have much physical strength in using the body well against other players? Well, I'm not a scout, first of all. Uh, second of all, as I mentioned in question number two about like a person who is six feet tall, right? So do scouts care if a player doesn't have much physical strength in using the body well against other players? So it depends on what you mean because I think even the smallest players and guys like Riyad Mahrez, right, on Manchester City, who's so rail thin, he probably weighs 137 pounds or 140 pounds at most, He's a super thin guy, really small. You'd think he'd be easy to knock off the ball, but he's actually really good at using his body. So do scouts care? I would hope they do because I think, again, you have to take responsibility for the type of body you were born with. Strengthen what you can. Get fitter as you can. Practice using your body as best you can, and then you move forward from there. I think saying well, I'm going to completely give up because I'm only 5'4 and I weigh 100 pounds is total BS because that's not how this works. The game is available to anybody and everybody as long as you work on the things that are going to make your game the best it can possibly be. So do more research into the type of body you have, what's best for your body type. Maybe consult a professional player for ideas. Uh, you can, again, sign up for a Zoom call or DM me on Instagram. The other option is go to a strength and conditioning coach and talk to them about how to get better in your body, better feeling in your body, because it's super important to know how to play with your physicality, no matter how large you are. So yes, to answer your question in a short term, do scouts care? 
if a player doesn't have much, yes, they do, and they will probably write you off if you can't at least use your body well. If you're super small and you draw fouls really easily, like a Neymar guy, right? Neymar, yeah, uses his body sometimes when he needs to, but he's small enough that it looks, he gets fouled so often and he buys into that, right? So he, he allows himself to flop every once in a while and not even flop, I'm like a technical flop, right? So that's something I would think about. It is uh, even players like that know how to use their body in ways that'll benefit their team. Question eight, can a collegiate player get signed by an MLS team on their own terms without the draft? Absolutely. I know tons of guys who didn't go into the MLS draft who got signed for MLS clubs. And I know guys who were academy players for those academies, like a Sounders Academy. In fact, one of my friends who was playing for the Sounders, and he's now at OKC Energy. He is a, he's a center forward for OKC Energy, or a winger, depending on the game. But he went straight out of college after his junior year, finished his junior year and that summer got signed as like outside on his own basically and he was playing in the MLS and got some game time and ended up transferring for other reasons but yeah I mean you can totally do that and I think it's a very it's, it's more likely that you'll get that type of signing versus into the draft the draft is only what 50 guys I think in the entire country which is crazy to me like that's I and don't quote me on that because I don't actually know if that's specific to the MLS or if that's a different league but the draft is like you're you're invited to a combine and then you get put into the draft and it's a whole thing and it's it's a lot of pol not not necessarily politics but just like it's a lot of moving pieces and parts which I think is something to keep in mind so I would say the majority of players who play in the MLS were not draft players they were players who either built their way up or they signed for an MLS club straight out of college or right in the middle of college before they went anywhere right that's something to keep in mind question number nine how can a player who doesn't play for a big youth club reach the next level and attract the attention of collegiate coaches? Great question. So I would say, like my friend that I mentioned, my very dear friend who now plays college and is a captain and starts, she lived in Walla Walla, Washington, which is a four-hour drive from where I live in Seattle. So she traveled four hours twice to, well, with games three times a week, eight hours each way, three days a week just to get good training in with a team that was nationally ranked. She was good enough, obviously, but she traveled all that way. So you have to make those sacrifices and I, you don't have to spend that type of money. You don't have to do whatever. In fact, I think she had like a Prius or something, so it ended up not costing that much. But anyway, that, that's not the point. The point is that you have to dedicate yourself 100% to it. And by any, you have to have that saying in your mind, like this has to happen by any means necessary. And if that means doing the dirty stuff and working on weekends to make enough money so that you can make gas money to travel here and there, do that, okay? Do that because I promise it will pay off. That type of stuff, it, it makes a huge difference when you're looking further and further on in your career. Um, if you don't play for a big youth club, then there's a couple more technical options that I'll chat about really quick, uh, but there's, more, there's a more detailed explanation in a, f a few videos coming, so you guys will understand that a little bit more. But I would say one is go play at a showcase with a team who's willing to host you as like a guest player. So sometimes tournaments will have a guest player team where they'll offer an application to players who don't necessarily play for the big clubs but are good enough to play in a showcase like that. You can go to those showcases with a bunch of other guys or gals who don't have a team and they want to play against these other players in front of, most importantly, all these college coaches and NCAA, NAIA, JUCO, all that stuff. So you take that route or you take an already established team. And again, this is not including all of the networking and highlight footage and stuff you should be collecting. LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, DMs, email, text messaging, calling all the college coaches that you wanna play for. You gotta do it all the dirty work then the second step is to get in 
and play in a tournament in front of those or go to an ID camp because ID camps can be incredibly beneficial for, for players. I would, I would argue that the majority of college players who aren't, who aren't in the top you know, 10 teams in the country get recruited through ID camps that they attend, especially at like the D3 and D2 and maybe NAIA level. They'll go to those ID camps that they, the, the, the schools will host once or twice a year. You get into those ID camps and you play directly under the coach. And then at those ID camps, even if you're younger than the cutoff, the coaches can still have a conversation with you because you're on campus paying to be there, yada, yada, yada. It's not like an official visit, right? So that hopefully makes sense. But again, go out of your way to find teams to play in front of college coaches with, bottom line. Final question, question number 10. Any tips to be a great center, defensive mid, or CDM? There's a lot. Game awareness is one, which I spoke about before. I think your passing ability and your directional first touch are absolutely crucial. Those are kind of the three big ones for a center defensive mid. And then, of course, being able to break up play, so tackling. You, got, you watch guys like Busquets, Casemiro, who's another great defensive midfielder, Gattuso. Although, for the majority of my viewers, I think he might be a little bit older than what you guys know. I'm trying to think of other good CDMs. Hmm. Like really amazing CDMs. Anyway, they're the ones who pull the strings. So again, you got to be really great at passing and distribution. You got to be really great at opening your body up. And then you got to be super great at game awareness and the ability to play forward when you possibly can, but play safe if you have to, right? So that's my quick and easy, quick and dirty tips for being a center defensive mid. That's it for the video, guys. Thanks so much for joining me again on Monday's Monday mornings Pacific Standard Time, I will be posting on my Instagram at noah.cavanaugh or Noah period Kavanaugh. On Instagram, you can go in there, hit that follow button, make sure you smash the like button on this video if you got value from it. Subscribe if you haven't already. There's a huge portion of you guys who aren't subscribed who watch my videos, so make sure you do that right now. And I will see you guys very soon. I am headed to Ottawa tomorrow. I'm very excited for it. So as of today, which is the 21st of September, I'm going to spend about five days doing training camp with them in Ottawa, and then we'll see what the next steps in my career are. Hopefully in the next couple of videos, you guys will see some pretty awesome stuff coming uh, your way because I'll have more experience in games and stuff, but also my way in the form of a contract and a new opportunity somewhere else in the United States, which I'm very excited for. As always, guys, be awesome. Take care. I'll see you guys in the next video.